times because they do communicate um, on the web. Um, we've got a short announcement to make um, concerning the trips. I have requested uh, Humbu, South Africa, to take us through that quickly, then we continue. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, colleagues. One quick announcement. We would like to request those delegates that haven't registered for the field trips that will be taking place on the 7th to do so by the end of today so that we can be able to finalize minor, minor arrangements in that regard. Thank you. Uh, are the details of where to register and At the who registration, to to? Okay. At the registration desk to your left when you get out of the hall, plenary hall. There are ladies there that will be able to assist you and give you, take you through what you are ex expecting to see in each of the uh, field trip. Thank you. Okay, we continue. As um, it was indicated before we took the lunch break that the, the chair of the credentials committee will take the floor to present the status on the sub submitted credentials. Uh, Algeria, in this case, will, will do that. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good uh, afternoon to everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to extend my warmest thanks to uh, South Africa uh, for having organized the seventh session of IWA. Now, uh, concerning the uh, results of uh, uh, the work done by our credentials uh, uh, committee, uh, here is the uh, status of uh, our work. So far, we have received uh, 41 credentials, 41 credentials, amongst which 35 have been accepted. 35, and the others that have not been accepted, there are four of them, four credentials, and then there are some credentials that have not yet been received. Another four have not been received. So these are the results so far, and we would like to kindly ask uh, the countries that have not yet uh, filed their credentials to do so as quickly as possible. We also have uh, uh, two uh, countries for which the credentials are still under review, under examination. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Algeria. Um, that's the report on the credentials and the plea to parties to um, address this issue and uh, submit their credentials. Um, we also want to acknowledge the presence of the Ambassador of Algeria to South Africa, who is sitting on the right side of the chair of the Credentials Committee. Uh, welcome, sir. Um, we now move on to agenda item 22. It's got a number of uh, sub-items. Uh, this agenda item deals with the guidance on the implementation of the agreement. Uh, so under this agenda item, we'll look at, uh, uh, I think we'll do th three um, of the meeting documents and then we'll refer you to the draft resolutions, but we are not going to present them. We'll start with the presentation by Melissa, uh, who is in the technical committee as a legal advisor. She will present uh, the document on behalf of the technical committee, um, which uh, will provide us with the guidance on satisfying the conditions um, especially those on paragraphs 2, 1, 3, 2.1.3 of the Iowa Action Plan. 
Delegates are referred to document 7.32 uh, on this particular item. Melissa. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, so over the lunch break, we listened to some really interesting side events on harvest-related issues. So I'm pleased to start the afternoon continuing in that vein by looking at some of the issues surrounding uh, the exemptions that AWA allows parties to grant in respect of its prohibitions on interleer taking. Okay, so to give you a bit of background to this document, um, as most of you will already be well aware, paragraphs 211 and 212 of the AO Action Plan prescribe various prohibitions that parties are expected to implement in order to protect column A populations and ensure that the taking of column B populations only occurs to the extent that this is sustainable. Um, however, there are several ways in which uh, parties are afforded a measure of flexibility in implementing these prohibitions. And one of, of the ways is through paragraph 213, which identifies various circumstances in which parties are permitted to grant exemptions to, uh, to these prohibitions. Now, back in 2007, when the last AWA review on hunting and trade legislation was conducted in terms of paragraph uh, 7.4 of the agreement, um, or of the action plan, rather, uh, one of the recommendations of this review was that the technical committee uh, develop guidance on various aspects of paragraph 213, um, and these recommendations were then endorsed by the MOP in resolution 4.3, uh, and this guidance document responds to that recommendation and that resolution. So just to give you... Um, an overall of the, uh, an overview of the documents as a whole. Uh, it begins by providing a brief description of the prohibitions um, prescribed by paragraphs 211 and, two, and 212. Uh, it provides a few words of guidance on those. However, the bulk of the document is really dedicated to deconstructing paragraph 213 and providing parties with guidance on satisfying the conditions identified in that paragraph. Um, and then finally, the document ends by giving some brief guidance uh, on parties reporting commitments concerning exemptions. Um, a couple of points uh, to note from the outset regarding this document. Uh, the first is that when this provision of the Airway Action Plan was initially drafted back when the agreement was negotiated in the 90s, um, this particular provision was partially modeled on similar exemptions provisions that are found in other legal instruments, so it was influenced by the exemptions provision in the CMS itself, um, but it was also heavily influenced by the language that already appeared in the exemptions provision of the Berne Convention, um, which of course is similar to the, the derogation provisions in the Birds Directive. Uh, those two instruments, of course, already have a very comprehensive, uh, and the technical committee felt sensible um, guidance concerning their respective exception and derogation provisions. Um, and so this existing body of guidance was considered in drafting this document, um, and the technical committee found it to be very useful. But of course, differences in language were also taken into consideration. Uh, it also needs to be borne in mind that, of course, Previous meetings of the parties to AWA have adopted a wealth of guidance on the interpretation of the agreements. Some of this guidance is relevant to the interpretation of paragraph 2.1, um, and so this document should be re read, aside, read alongside previous uh, guidance, and previous guidance is referred to where appropriate. Right, in terms of the prohibitions required by paragraphs 211 and 212, I won't go into these in detail, but the main uh, point that this document stresses is that not all of the requisite prohibitions um, in the AOA Action Plan are framed in absolute terms. Right, some of the prohibitions are contingent upon the impact that certain conduct will um, have upon relevant AOA populations. That's the case, for instance, with the prohibition on deliberate disturbance. The zoning uh, needs to be prohibited to the extent that its impact would be significant for the population's conservation. Um, some provisions also recognize uh, 
ver the, the availability of very specific grounds of exemption. Okay, so, for instance, paragraph 211 allows exemptions uh, for the hunting of certain column A populations within the framework of an international single species action plan. Um, paragraph 212B also recognizes the potential for exemptions um, in respect of certain methods of harvest uh, where it occurs for livelihoods purposes. Um, although as this document stresses, there need to be measures in place to ensure that that livelihood staking is still sustainable. So the point essentially is that a measure of flexibility is already factored into these prohibitions, and that's going to influence whether or not it's necessary to rely upon paragraph 213 to begin with. If it is necessary, to, or if a party feels that it is necessary to rely upon um, paragraph 2.1.3 and the exemptions uh, permitted by that paragraph, then there are several conditions that need to be satisfied in order to comply with the agreement. The first of these is that there must be no other satisfactory solution um, available which does not involve deviating from AWA's ordinary prohibitions. And so this guidance document um, essentially emphasizes that states should give serious consideration to the problem or situation that they're seeking to resolve. Um, whether or not alternatives are available that don't involve deviating from the agreement's ordinary provisions, and then whether or not these are actually capable of resolving the problem or situation at hand. Um, it advises that any determination that other satisfactory solutions are unavailable should be based on objective and verifiable reasoning. Um, and it also recognizes that there's an element of proportionality to this and that, that national authorities should choose um, the most appropriate approach that has the least adverse effects on the species while solving the problem or situation. Now, in terms of paragraph 2.1.3, paragraphs A to E uh, recognize several grounds for, for exemption, um, and the paragraph can only be relied upon to the extent that the conduct in question actually satisfies one of these grounds. The first um, deals with exemptions uh, for the purpose of preventing serious damage to crops, water, and fisheries, so, or, or fisheries. So the guidance document um, explains that there are a number of elements uh, to this, this exemption. The first is that the granting of exemption must actually play a preventative role. Okay, damage need not necessarily already have occurred, but it must be likely that it will occur in the future if an exemption isn't granted. Um, as is very clear from the language, it needs to be serious as opposed to minor damage, and the guidance uh, suggests that the types of factors that should be considered in determining seriousness include the intensity, duration, and scale of the damage that is expected to occur. It also advises um, that the scale of the measures that are permitted by the exemption should align with the nature and scale of the problem. Okay, so it recognizes that different problems um, have different spatial dimensions, for instance, and that response measures should, should align with, with, um, with the scale. So, for instance, um, a very, very localized damage oftentimes would only justify very local response measures. Um, and then finally, the guidance uh, emphasizes that in terms of this particular ground of exemption, only very specific types of property can be protected, um, specifically crops, water, and fisheries. Um, and the reason for that limitation under AWA is of course that AWA is designed to address water birds specifically as opposed to a broader range of taxa um, in respect of which you'd expect a broader range of conflict. Um, the action plan's um, ground of exemption for protection of public interests is a bit more open-ended than the first exemption. It doesn't give an exhaustive list of types of interests involved. Um, it simply stresses that there must be public interests 
and that the public interest must be imperative and overriding. So from this, it's implicit that there needs to be a balancing of um, the interest that is sought to be protected by granting an exemption and the um, conservation interest that it was designed to protect. Ordinarily, in order to be an imperative and overriding public interest, this document suggests that it would need to be a long-term interest um, as opposed to a short-term um, interest or uh, an interest that only had benefits in the short term. The ground of exemption for research, education, and re-establishment is relatively straightforward. Uh, the document essentially uh, simply directs parties to other useful guidance documents that have been uh, adopted under AOA in that regard. It provides more detail uh, in respect of the um, ground of exemption for judicious use of birds in small numbers. Um, just very briefly, this, this particular ground of exemption differs from the others insofar as it doesn't identify a specific purpose for granting an exemption. But what's important is not so much the purpose for which the exemption is being granted as much as the restrictions subject to which it's granted. Um, and a number of additional restrictions are incorporated within this ground of exemption. Uh, and these are unpacked in some, some detail in, in the guidance documents, which emphasizes, for instance, the need for strict oversights, um, uh, for strict oversights of, of implementations of the exemptions, response to non-compliance, um, the fact that authorized activities need to be specific in their, their effect by targeting particular species or birds within those species, uh, by ensuring either that non-target species um, are not impacted or if they are not taken or if they are taken can be released unharmed, etc. It identifies various limitations that can be imposed um, in order to meet the requirements uh, that, that the exemption only be granted to a limited extent. And in respect of the small numbers requirement, it proposes that small numbers be taken to mean a number of birds um, which is sufficiently small to have a negligible effect on population dynamics. In respect to the of the final ground uh, of exemption um, for purposes of enhancing uh, propag propagation or survival of the populations concerned, this language um, it actually came from a similar provision in the Convention on Migratory Species. The Technical Committee did discuss that there is clearly some overlap between this and the third ground of, of exemption for research and reintroductions, um, but felt that it could be used, um, could be relied upon by parties to grant exemptions for conservation measures that aren't already covered by by paragraph, by subparagraph three. For instance, translocations that don't take the form of reintroductions. Um, and then the final uh, set of conditions concerning paragraph 2.1.3 is that even if one of the grounds of exemption is present, even if there's no other satisfactory solution available, exemptions can only be permitted by states to the extent um, that they don't operate to the detriment of Table 1 populations, and they need to be uh, precise as to content and limited in space and time. So in respect of that non-detriment requirement, um, remember that one of AWA's funda fundamental principles, as articulated in Article 2.1 of the agreement, is um, that parties must take measures to maintain or restore favorable conservation status. Okay, so reading the exemptions provision with that general requirement, it's clear that exemptions mustn't be granted if this would have, a if this would be detrimental to the maintenance or restoration of a population's favorable conservation status. Um, and special caution needs to be taken, of course, then if you're dealing with a population that's in an unfavorable conservation status. It doesn't necessarily mean that an exemption can't be granted in respect to such populations, but it should only be granted if it wouldn't impair the prospects of population recovery. 
um, discusses the fact that international single species action plans and international single species management plans can play a very valuable role in coordinating derogations or exemption schemes, um, ensuring that the cumulative impact is not detrimental. Um, it also provides some advice on the contents um, of authorizations. Um, and it advises um, that states should have measures in place to monitor the impact of exemptions and ensure compliance with the conditions under which they're granted uh, and respond to non-compliance in order to ensure that they don't have a detrimental effect in order to comply with this, uh, this condition. And finally, um, it's worth taking note of the fact that Paragraph 213 of the action plan does also contain a, a reporting obligation. Okay, so the language of uh, the action plan's legal text says that parties shall, as soon as possible, inform the agreement secretariat of any exemptions granted pursuant to this, uh, this provision. So the documents suggest that the ideal case scenario is that notification should be as immediate as possible. Um, and it requests that the information contained in these notifications um, include the species in respect of which the exemption is granted, the purpose of the exemption, the number of birds or eggs in respect of which the authorization is granted, its territorial coverage, um, and, and its time span. And so the action requested of the meeting of the parties um, is that they review this draft guidance um, and if they see fit to do so, adopt it through draft resolution eight. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Marisa. Any reaction from parties or delegates? I see Estonia, EU. Thank you, Chair. So the EU and uh, its member states recognize the work done by the technical committee and the guidance and on satisfying the conditions of uh, paragraph uh, one, uh, two, uh, one, three on the IO action plan. And we welcome the adoption of these guidelines as a necessary step uh, towards clear and understandable framework for the use of paragraph 213. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think, Marisa, you still have to stay there. I don't see any other call for the floor. Thank you, Estonia. We now move to the next one, still on the same agenda, item 22, specifically dealing now with the draft guidance on IOWAS provisions on non-native species. Uh, you are referred to document 7.33, 7.33, um, and Marisa will take us through. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This presentation will be shorter, I promise. Um, yes, yeah, so as you'll also be aware, um, it was agreement text and, and action plan contains several um, provisions regarding non-native species, including provisions on the control and eradication of these species. Um, at the 13th meeting of the AWA Technical Committee, when discussing uh, the meeting of the parties call for additional guidance on non-native species, the Technical Committee decided um, that it would be worthwhile to draft a brief document concerning the naturalization of non-native species um, and focusing in particular on issues surrounding uh, their legal control. Um, and when drafting this document, it was then decided that this also presented an opportunity to align some of AWA's interpretations of terminology with those that have been endorsed under other international fora. So to give a brief overview of the document then, it first of all um, proposes definitions for certain terminology used in AOS provisions on non-native species. Uh, it provides clarifications concerning 
the agreement's provisions on the control and eradication of non-native species and the implications of these for parties' national legislation. Um, and then given that a wealth of guidance um, has already been adopted under AWA and other fora concerning non-native species, it also refers parties to some um, key guidance documents that they may find useful in developing legislation on this issue. And so the document draws a distinction between um, species biological state status as indigenous versus non-native, the consequences that follow a non-native species introduction, and then thirdly, the appropriate policy responses. Um, and it suggests that this, that this distinction be, be, keep in, be, be kept in mind by parties when developing their, their policy responses. In terms of biological status, uh, the document proposes several definitions um, for the terms indigenous species, non-native species, introduction, um, and invasive non-native species. Um, I won't go th through those individual uh, definitions in detail now, but essentially they were drawn from interpretations that have already been uh, endorsed by states in the context of the Convention on Biological Diversity um, and indeed uh, also incorporated into various other international policy processes. Um, the guidance document uh, highlights that none of these definitions hinge on the period of time that's elapsed since a non-native species introduction. Um, and so it discourages parties from defining factually non-native species as indigenous. In terms of consequences, uh, it's important to bear in mind that AWA's provisions of no on non-native species don't require that these species be controlled as an end in itself. It, AWA's provisions are concerned with preventing detrimental impacts on table one populations. Um, it's also important to bear in mind, however, uh, that the consequences of an introduction can change over time, um, insofar as there's often a time lag between an non-native species introduction and the first indication of, of harmful impacts. So how does this all translate into appropriate policy responses? Um, well, first of all, the documents um, highlights that policy responses should depend largely on the consequences of an introduction. So as I said, whether or not it's going to be detrimental for table one populations. However, um, given the difficulty in predicting detrimental impacts, it emphasizes the importance of the precautionary principle in this regard. Um, and this isn't something new. This emphasis on the precautionary principle does also appear in other AOA guidance, and indeed the agreement text itself. Um, it also needs to be borne in mind that control measures themselves can have detrimental impacts on AOA populations. And as a result of this, the document also emphasizes the need for control and eradication measures to be conducted in a manner that's systematic, organized, and super, supervised in order to minimize impact, undesired impacts on native species. For instance, significant disturbance or accidental taking. Insofar as um, AWA requires control and eradication measures, uh, parties obviously left with considerable discretion as to the precise legal mechanisms that they use um, for implementing control and eradication measures. An extensive body of guidance already exists on crafting such legislation, and the documents includes an, uh, an appendix um, directing parties to such guidance. Um, but it does make a, key, a few key points specifically about um, the legal protection of non-native species, because at times parties, or there are some parties that either deliberately or inadvertently have legislation which provides legal protection for non-native species, for instance, by incorporating them into lists of protected taxa. Um, the documents 
acknowledges that this approach is not prohibited per se by the agreement, but it acknowledges that it might, in certain circumstances, offer certain opportunities, such as providing a means of controlling um, these measures so that they don't have uh, an undesirable impact on native species. Um, however, it also cautions that there are certain undesirable impacts that, that may result, in particular if this protected status uh, diverts or results in the diversion of attention or resources from native species, um, or if this protected status precludes or delays response measures and control measures if they become, um, if they become necessary. As a result, the document uh, recommends that if parties, for whatever reason, decide to take the approach of including some non-native species in their lists of protected taxa, that they should have measures in place to ensure that these species don't attract conservation priority in the same manner as native species. Um, and secondly, they should ensure that this protected status won't impede rapid response measures if such measures, measures become necessary due to a threat to native biodiversity. And it gives the, the example of having highly responsive licensing or derogation systems in place um, in order to address this, uh, combined with contingency plans. Um, if a state's legislation is structured in such a manner that such rapid response isn't possible, then the document advises reviewing the list of, non of, of protected taxa in order to remove, remove non-native species. And so finally, the action requested by the meeting of the parties is to review this, this draft guidance. And again, if it sees it appropriate to do so, adopt the guidance through draft resolution eight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marissa. Those are the elements of the guidance as provided. Any um, party that would want to take the floor? Okay, Estonia, on this item. Thank you. Uh, the EU and its member states recognized the work done by the technical committee and the guidance of, uh, on the non-native species. And uh, we note that uh, while uh, Working on the implementation uh, of the regulation uh, from the EU, uh, number 1143-2014, uh, uh, on the prevention and management of the um, introduction and spread of uh, invasive alien species, the uh, methodology uh, itself for risk assessment uh, of a invasive alien species uh, has been adopted. And we propose that uh, the technical committee should take into account appropriate methodologies for risk, uh, risk assessment, uh, including those uh, used by the EU as well. So, thank you. Okay. Think, do you want to react to that? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Can we now move on to the next um, sub-agenda item along the same category of uh, items on agenda item 22, which is guidance on the implementation of the agreement. We now look at the uh, document that's going to be presented by David. Uh, it's on guidance on taking a systematic approach to responding to waterbed declines. It's document 7.34, document 7.34. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this, uh, so um, I, I'll present this document very, very briefly. Uh, I hope it's, it's fairly clear. Uh, it reflects work uh, undertaken by the technical committee. So where did, where did it come from? Well, it actually responded to a request, uh, or three separate requests. The first was to produce an overview of various available tools to address regional declines. The second was a request for guide to guidance on invasive aquatic weeds. And then finally, um, a, a target in the current strategic plan uh, to collate information on best practices uh, for waterbird conservation programs. 
So, um, just briefly, uh, at the outset, issues to note, this, this complements uh, existing uh, guidance that uh, you've adopted in, in the past. Um, for those of us charged with water bird conservation, um, we, we, we often have a, a need for guidance, uh, and a need for information, and much other guidance uh, does exist. Uh, the question is uh, where to go to, to get it and, and what's, what's good guidance. Um, so it, the, the idea, the, the concept here is that this is a bit of a guide to, to guidance. Um, at the late stage of drafting, uh, IUCN uh, published their extremely comprehensive guidelines for species conservation planning. Uh, we, we, we highlight that. I mean, that, that is also a, a, a massively useful document which uh, sits along, alongside this. The, the document's in three parts, and I'll just, just briefly uh, take you through those. So, that, so the introduction really stresses that the, that the need for conservation approaches um, should be adaptive and systematic. Um, and this little diagram here, this really sort of reflects the, uh, the, the sort of a classic adaptive approach where you set your objectives, uh, you implement actions, you monitor what happens, uh, you then reassess uh, and then go around the, the, the cycle again, occasionally fundamentally revisiting the, the, the management options. And that's, that's a very standard form of approach to site uh, management, uh, for example, but it, it's also valid in the context of uh, species conservation programs. The first section of the, the, the guidance is really just a sort of high-level checklist of, of issues. There's uh, 11 issues laid out. Um, really stressing the need to take a systematic evidence-based approach, um, uh, establishing clear statements of needs, uh, and as I said, an adaptive approach, which includes monitoring and reviewing what you're doing as you go, go along. The most uh, substantive part of the, the Guide to Guidance um, is a, is a nine-page table. Um, it looks fairly scarily complicated, but I'll, I'll just briefly um, sort of summarize, um, explain what, where it is. So it's structured in, in five uh, main sections relating to actions uh, it, with respect to sustaining habitat, protecting species, regulating and management, managing human activity, improving knowledge, and maintaining site networks. And in the first column there over on the, the, the left-hand side, uh, the, there's a series of headings which breaks down those sections into, into um, further sort of action areas. So, for example, sustaining necessary habitat, the, the first subsection is actions to avoid loss of critical habitat. The middle column uh, is uh, guidance, uh, a list of guidance on methodologies and, and approaches. And what we try to do is to pull together um, a lot of information from previously adopted guidance, uh, our own AWA guidance, but also the comprehensive Ramsar um, handbooks for, for, what, for wise use. Um, and as you, you can see there, the, we've, we've tried to, well, we have put in um, hot links to the different language versions of, of a lot of these documents where, where that exists. So the idea is you can just click on the ES and it will take you straight to the Spanish translation of um, the, the, relevant, the relevant handbooks. Uh, and so the, the, there's, there's a great long list of um, relevant good guidance in relation to each of these subject areas. And then um, finally, the, uh, the, the, the column over on the, the, the right, the extreme right, um, is not so much guidance on methodology, but it's uh, a selection of good case studies um, where there's been um, management interventions, conservation action are undertaken, well written up, um, and it's, uh, it's a guide to, it's not a guide, it's, uh, it, it gives a list of um, good case studies that are informative for those thinking about implementing uh, relevant action. So, so here this, is, uh, this section relates to predator control, including uh, control of invasive non-native species we've just been hearing about from Melissa. And then the case studies over on the right-hand side there relate to some good uh, scientific papers relating to uh, control and management of, of, of mink and, and other species. So, and, and then, so the, 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 uh, the little footnotes, the, the superscript links to the full citation for the paper, which is uh, listed at the end of the, the document in a conventional um, scientific paper um, reference list. 
So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, any party that wants to take the floor? Estonia. Thank you. Uh, so once again, the EU and its member states recognize the work done by the technical committee. Uh, this time on developing a guidance on taking a systematic approach to responding to vertebrate declines, um, a checklist to potential actions. Um, we also welcome the adoption of these guidelines as an important step to enhance the planning responses to vertebrate declines. We propose to add um, references to five uh, different guidance documents available in English, and we will uh, submit these concrete changes in writing. So. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, David. Um, we'll now move on. There are some few items that uh, are, still, are still outstanding before we move on to the working groups. And uh, we want to make sure that we cover this uh, in time to allow for working groups to have that time. Um, the first item that we need to look at um, it's an item that is within the category of what we call the waterboard monit uh, waterbed mini monitoring um, uh, issues. It's agenda item 21. Um, Zabolx will be coming through to take us through the draft revised uh, Iowa conservation guidelines on waterbed monitoring. It's document 7.35, document 7.35. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I would like to uh, give a very, very short uh, introduction to the revised Iowa Conservation Guidelines on Water World Monitoring. This has been produced um, by the Africa Eurasian Water Bird Monitoring Partnership. The previous guidelines uh, has been published in 2003. Uh, it's Simon's work, actually, who is taking the, the notes. Uh, but monitoring is still insufficient for 50% of the Iowa water bird populations. So these uh, suggest that we need to strengthen um, the advice, what we give for contracting parties, how to set up monitoring. And monitoring is often done, that's at least our observation, often done for an organization or a project, while monitoring actually should be primarily satisfy information requirements of national policy and management. Therefore, uh, it's important to, to, to put the world guidance on a different um, footing, but we also need to re realize that um, to be able to produce flyway level population size and trend estimates, uh, we need some sort of coordination uh, concerning which season a certain population should be monitored, whether it's at the breeding uh, sites or at the, the wintering sites, um, this needs to be decided, and these agreed season uh, should be agreed. So the new guidelines um, outlines a stepwise process of setting up monitoring and goes through these steps uh, concerning the design, the setup, and the implementation phase of national monitoring schemes. Its Appendix 1 provides access following the same guide-to-guidance principles as David already mentioned um, in his speech to other general references uh, to monitoring methods and techniques. So interested readers, um, national uh, coordinators of monitoring can get access to these documents. And this is the moment where I would like to actually thank RSPB who has made available some of their monitoring methods guideline text for this purpose. Appendix 2 outlines um, just in a telephone book format the recommended monitoring methods and seasons for each population covered by the agreement 
exactly for the purpose I mentioned earlier, to set that kind of coordination. Also, we have some key recommendations emerging from these guidance. One is that contracting parties should consider water mon monitoring as a key component of their adaptive management processes. This, again, links back to what David mentioned. Monitoring of flyway populations in the seasons when they are geographically separated from other populations. It's very difficult to do any conclusions from uh, counting wintering dunlins when they are overlapping and coming from different parts of the breeding area. Uh, the next recommendation is to estimate trends based on annual surveillance of monitoring sites. The emphasis here is that based on monitoring sites, which can be a relatively small number, uh, but large number enough to provide statistical robustness. And we re recommend to estimate population size based on periodic surveys, which means that either based on censuses, which can be done only in case of a few species with relatively small distributions, or using methods which provide statistically robust, um, representative samples and statistically robust estimates. Uh, this is a kind of movement from the current practice because very often it happens that countries try to count everything. And what we are saying, don't count everything, but count it at certain periods uh, or focus your efforts. That way you can save resources. Finally, uh, or not finally, but uh, the next point is that if a population can be separated from uh, others, both in the breeding and in the non-breeding season, then we suggest usually uh, to use a different method to estimate the population size, and we often recommend the breeding season. And that's consistent very much with the Article 12 reporting for the EU member states, where actually the separation of breeding and wintering season really matters a lot. Uh, and use, um, if it's possible, for trend estimates, annual monitoring at the wintering areas, because that is cheaper and uh, forms a kind of larger generic monitoring uh, framework. The other uh, recommendation is that um, coordinate and distribute the timing of surveys in a six-year cycle uh, feeding into the IOWA and the EU Birds Directive Article 12 reporting. But these distribution of species or species groups will require some additional work uh, to agree on a schedule. Monitor national populations and sites also in other relevant seasons. We recognize that the timing which can contribute to international population size estimates might not be the timing which is appropriate to assess um, what is the status of the wintering population in a certain country if you have the, the flyway population size is estimated based on the breeding one, or um, if a site acts as an important uh, staging area, counting during the, the staging period is also important to assess whether the site still fulfills its uh, importance and its function in supporting the annual cycle of the species. Develop integrated population monitoring, uh, and we recognize here that that is quite a big ask. So therefore, we suggest particularly for harvested and action plan species. Most of the action plans has indicators related to certain demographic parameters, increasing reproductive rates, reducing mortality rates, for example. And monitor also environmental conditions, at least at the key sites. And these recommendations closely linked to objective three of the IEVA strategic plan for 2019 and uh, 27. However, this is an area where there are still different systems out there, and they are not exactly the same, so it re requires some further work to, to fine-tune. And further work is needed on prioritizing investment into the development of monitoring. So thank you very much, and I also would like to thank uh, for the collaboration, BirdLife International, SOVON, um, 
who contributed a lot to this, and WWT who contributed a lot to the uh, development of these guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, much appreciated. Any party that would like to take the floor? Is that uh, Switzerland? Uh, no, it's France. Uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, apologies, I'm told it's the French Hunting Association. Just before I take you, can I check if there are parties that would want to take the floor before? Okay, all right, you can, you can go ahead. Oh, yes, there's a... Oh, there's Gambia. Let me take Gambia first before, before I come to you. Yeah, thank you very much, President. I welcome the, the, the um, document that uh, Shabotsk has presented us. Thank you very much. I just have a question. How is citizen science... Um... Oh, sorry. Um, oh, yes, yeah. I, the French Hunting Association, I want you to come after Gambia. Yes, Gambia first. Yeah, I, my question is about the monitoring guidelines. Uh, the guidelines, the, um, I, I, I don't see how uh, it has uh, touches on the environmental aspect, like uh, the habitat condition. And if they are so, I, I want uh, to understand uh, the, the, the indicators of uh, environmental condition. And also, I want to know if this uh, uh, guideline is available on the, on the Iowa website. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, monitoring of the site conditions is uh, still in a little bit in a, in a development phase. Under the EU Birds Directive Article 12 reporting, EU member states have some system to report on the condition of special protection areas. Under the, um, under the Bird Life Important Bird Area Program, there is a system for monitoring important bird areas which looks into site conditions and threats, what threats are emerging and under the, um, the Wadense Flyway Initiative East Atlantic uh, Monitoring Program, this system has been developed a little bit further. And uh, what the guidelines pr provide at this moment is uh, some sort of links to all of these available guidances and countries at this moment are left to you know, uh, evaluate the merit of all of these methods and, and choose what is the best to use. Uh, however, uh, we believe that some sort of harmonization, some sort of joint of thinking would be useful in this respect. Uh, just to give you an example, what is the habitat change on a certain site? It might be that volunteers going out to do the cons are not the best people to do maybe using the results of remote sensing uh, in a more centralized fashion might be more effective and using those volunteers to ground truth those kind of changes which are recognized by uh, remote sensing. So this is the aspect where we are saying some further work is needed and some of the organizations I mentioned, uh, BirdLife International so on, are already working in, in that respect. Um, yeah, thank you, that's for Gambia. Thank you very much. Uh, French um, Hunting Association. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much for the presentation, Shabalsk. Um We just wonder, and it is not really clear to our point of view, that how is data from citizen science included in this assessment of population trends and so on? And um, we think uh, this topic would benefit from further discussion in the working group. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. So, I usually describe the International Water Birth Census as the largest citizen science scheme on Earth. So, uh, that already involves about uh, 10,000 volunteers annually. Uh, adding to that, we are using information from the Pan-European Common Bird Monitoring Scheme that also based on citizen science. However, these guidelines recognize that citizen science might not work everywhere, not under all conditions. So we also, we don't want to export a Western European approach, which is based on mostly citizen science and NGOs for decades. We recognize that in certain parts of the IEVA agreement area, protected area staff and others, uh, hunting agencies might be in a better position to help governments to collect the necessary information. What we try to emphasize in the guidance that you need to, well, you need to cook with what you have. So you have to find the conditions uh, and the opportunities under your own circumstances. I hope that it answers your question. Thank you very much. I think he also alluded to the fact that uh, the item will be relevant in the discussions, uh, working groups. The last uh, party to take the floor, UK. Thank you. If I could just briefly respond to the point that uh, Gambia made uh, earlier. The um, the, the, the issue of site condition monitoring is one of the topics in the uh, guide to guidance we were pr previously presenting where there is uh, links particularly to uh, extensive Ramsar guidance on that. So that's well covered in the earlier document. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Polk. Um, we'll now move on to the next item. Um, there's no reference document but the information is very important um, for the draft resolutions that we'll be looking at. It's a presentation on the highlights and key messages from the Climate Resilient Flyways Project. Uh, one of the project team members, uh, Marian, will be taking us through that. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I have the honor to present uh, uh, a project that we launched in the previous uh, MOP in, uh, in Bonn. And since then, we've worked together with uh, 10 organizations, among which, uh, thankfully, the Ethiopian uh, and Malinese uh, government as well, towards a climate resilient flyway network and with uh, support of the German government. Uh, climate resilient flyway, how do you get there? Well, first of all, you have to know how the climate, uh, the climate change will impact the flyways and the waterbirds. That is something we will uh, elaborate further on during this presentation. Of course, then, uh, wetland biodiversity waterbird uh, considerations need to be integrated into the policies of the different parties of the range states, especially related to the climate uh, policy. So that is something we work on, especially in Mali and Ethiopia. Of course, uh, even if everything is written down perfectly, uh, action on the ground makes a difference. Uh, so we start working in Mali, in the Inner Niger Delta, and in Ethiopia, uh, around Lake Abiyata, uh, to see what we can do to increase the climate buffer for these sites and conserve them for the future. And, of course, in the end, that's not about saving two sites. It's not about, even if we manage, it's not about saving a flyway. Um, we need to scale up. And that's where we would like to extend our invitation to you. Together with our organizations, can we work together? But that is for later. So climate change uh, and the impact on wetlands and waterbirds. So this is maybe a familiar uh, picture, this is how climate change uh, will affect temperature by 2050. Um, that is one layer that we have to take into consideration. But if we want to know what happens to water birds, we need to know more. We need to take into account precipitation, rainfall. How will that change? Um, but even then, 
just rain, and that is quite widely available from the modeling work uh, of the different universities and consolidated by the UNFCCC. We don't really know yet what will happen in a wetland, in a river, because what's happening in a wetland might be affected by rainfall a thousand kilometers upstream. Um, so we need to uh, bring that down to a landscape level, to a basin level, to see what happens. And together with the McGill, Wisconsin, and Castle Universities, uh, we managed to do so. Um, and this is a first map of a major work that we have just concluded. Um, what you already see, so we've now downscaled climate change impact um, predictions for Africa, Europe, and West Asia on the landscape, uh, on, on, on the wetland level, on the stream level. Um, you already see that uh, major uh, water flow reductions we expect in uh, uh, around Morocco, uh, Dac uh, Dakar, Senegal, uh, but maybe also uh, around the Sud and uh, uh, in, um, uh, but perhaps also an increase in water flow in areas like uh, Somalia. Although this is a percentage change, currently there's not so much rain, so the effects might not be there, but still it's something to take into consideration. Then we know what will happen to water flows, but what does that mean for water birds? Uh, what we are especially interested here in this room. Um, well, we need to do some additional work. First of all, we brought together 45 million bird observations together. Quite a lot of work, and thankfully in this time of age we can do that. We did so for 247 water bird species. And we combined those with climate and habitat layers. Um, so if you have an observation with a coordinate, that coordinate also has, combining with all those climate and habitat layers, a specific temperature, specific rainfall, specific altitude. And that is something you can combine to model habitat suitability maps and predict that for the current range. And if you have that, you can start modeling the current situation, but also the future situation. And in order to do that well, you cannot do that one time, you need to do it a lot, and then jointly bring that together in ensemble predictions. So, what are the results? This is summarized the result of what will happen uh, with the water, water bird populations. You cannot, of course, with migratory water birds, you cannot just say, this is what happened to a species, you have to scale that down to either breeding season, passage, and a wintering or uh, wintering grounds. And of course, we also have our resident species. So most will lose relatively small part of their current range. The net uh, range could actually increase, um, but some of the current sites will lose. Passage and wintering ranges may even increase uh, because species may move further north. Sedentary species and the breeding range of Palearctic migrants are probably going to lose out. Um, and take into account that we looked at climate, temperature, habitat aspects as they currently are. We were not able to include habitat loss because it's quite difficult to, to predict uh, in 20, uh, 30 years from now. And also sea level rise and the exact impact on what that will have on, for example, mudflats, we could not model. The data was not yet available to do that precisely. Um, to give you some examples, so we have 274 species where we have these maps. How would that look for Arctic breeding waders? In general, they're losing out. Here you see bar-tailed godwit. Um, we predict that there will be a lot of losses in especially Scandinavia, the southern part of its breeding range. In the north, there's actually still some gains to be, have, be had. Then we go to Little Stint, slowly moving a bit towards real tundra specialists. Also there you see losses uh, and a lot of green, which means uh, the, the area remains suitable. Kuryu sandpiper uh, is going to lose quite a lot. Uh, still areas remain in the high Russian Arctic. Sandling, the species still quite common along European sandy coasts, uh, that 
might be a problem because the area that is suitable for this species, uh, yeah, well, the North Pole is a sea. There's no land habitat anymore to move forward, uh, northward to. So that is a species that might have a big problem in the future. Sociable lapwing, here the page of the BirdLife data zone. Uh, currently already uh, severely threatened, critically endangered species, uh, retreating from its former habitat. Climate change predictions uh, show that this will continue and that the habitat will lose further, the breeding habitat. So these are just a few examples. Of course, there's also positive examples to give. Um, but when we summarize it for the whole 247 species and look at the habitat suitability to contain water birds, this is the generic picture that you see. So predominantly, we see that um, Africa, Mediterranean, and Southwest Asia lose on water birds' suitability. Predominantly gains in Northeastern Europe. Uh, the winters get milder, so it's easier for birds there to maintain even throughout the year. And um, so these changes are both reflected by hydrological changes and as well rain shifts by uh, temperature changes. So this is the general picture. And uh, yeah, especially some areas are highlighted that at least for us were quite surprising, especially for example, the Sambesi region. Um, but we, in the end, we want to know where, which countries, which sites we need to act upon. And we translated that using the critical sites network. Uh, critical sites, the most important water bird sites that we have and are uh, uh, as such recognized by IEWA. Um, so the most severe predicted deterioration uh, for, of suitability of the, of the, uh, the species that it's currently des uh, designated for are in Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, Southwest Asia, and as, as well as the high Arctic. Increasing average suitability is predominantly in the boreal zone. As I said, the area year-round gets suitable, more suitable there. So in the end, focusing more and more, um, these are the areas where we feel we should focus our attention to uh, in order to ensure that these sites remain suitable also in the future. And we need to act now upon that uh, by increasing their buffer, buffer function. Um, Botswana, Zambia. Namibia, Algeria and Tunisia, the Caspian region, Middle East, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Mesopotamia, West Africa, Spain, and Kenya, Tanzania. Um, so what do we need to do on those sites? Um, we see both in Mali and Ethiopia, we see one big spot, not as big as the other ones, but still it's somewhere to start and what, what we can do uh, on the landscape level. And we've been working in uh, Ethiopia around Lake Abiyata, uh, up to 250,000 water birds present there, the most important site for Ethiopia. Uh, and here we work on the landscape scale to ensure that the water actually will reach the lake as well as improve the park management. And in the Inner Niger Delta, traditionally we have been working with our partners uh, to improve community natural resource management. But what's happening upstream with several dams being developed? Um, that is something we want to tell you more about in the, in the side event. Of course, we cannot do it alone. As said, it is a collaboration of 10 parties uh, supported by the German uh, uh, government and as well as we receive good support of the Iowa Secretariat. Um, and we hope to continue to do so. Um, then, of course, this is a very short story, the, mainly the presentation of the, the climate uh, impact work. Um, if you want to know more about your country, your critical sites, and also what kind of impact uh, climate change will have on the water flows in your country, visit criticalsites.wetlands.org. Quite soon, we will also upload all the climate, uh, climate impact maps per species here. We already have it in tables available, but the maps is still work in progress. 
Of course, if you want to know more also about our landscape initiatives, um, visit our side event tomorrow, Thursday, uh, tomorrow at 12 uh, at the Pelican Room. We provide lunch, no worries, there's food. Uh, come and discuss with us. Also because we want to see, we started now in Ethiopia, in Mali, but two countries is not, is not enough. How can we as this group together uh, see what countries we can work in more, what areas we need to work in more? And of course, visit our booth. We have the uh, critical site network tool ready. Uh, we're ready to show you also all the maps, the critical site network tool. We're happy to explain how it works. Um, and also after this meeting or already during, uh, don't hesitate to send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marijn. Um, we are not going to open the floor for comments or questions. Um, the open invitation was given to all of you, uh, the side event tomorrow, um, but we felt that this, import, this information is very important for decision making. Thank you very much. We now move on to the last category of uh, issues that we want to focus on. Um, institutional arrangements as well as finance and administrative matters. Um, we'll ask the Executive Secretary to take us through the first one, which is Agenda Item 24A, uh, Agenda Item 24A, uh, specifically on the draft resolution number 10 on institutional arrangements for the Standing Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we go quite quickly through this draft resolution. Uh, <clears throat> just to, to tell you that in, in the preamble, we recall the establishment of the STC through resolution 2.6, and we recall also in the preamble the task which have been assigned to the Standing Committee. Then we acknowledge the active role of the STC, and it has been shown uh, during uh, the report of the chair yesterday morning, if you remember. And then further acknowledge that the STC has provided guidance and advice to the Secretariat. And let me tell you on behalf of the Secretariat that um, the STC has always responded very quickly to our request or uh, uh, request for advice or, or guidance. And thanks to, to, to all of them. Then, in the, in the operative paragraph, so it's, it's decision proposed to you, to the MOP7, we first adopted, we first adopt the revised regionalization scheme, I hope you will adopt it, for the operation of the IVA Standing Committee, as presented in Annex 1. We have realized that we, we have never produce such a list. So uh, Annex 1 will show parties and Orange State and their link with uh, the regional uh, scheme for, forever. So it will be a very useful document for everybody because as a party or non, uh, Orange State, you can go directly to this Annex and you will know to which country, which region you belong. Operative, uh, operative paragraph 2 you will have to approve the list of elected or reconfirmed regional representative for the, for the standing committee as follows. So you have the five uh, seats for regional representative, two are for Europe. Sorry. Ah, okay, yeah. It seems that I'm too quick with the slide I, I put on the screen. Yeah, I'd rather to look at this one. Sorry. So. We will adopt this regionalization scheme, and then you will have to adopt the list of elected or reconfirmed regional representative for the standing committee. This will be, of course, discussed during the, the working group. Just want to recall you that the normal term for a standing committee member is six years. It means two MOP, of course, on exceptional basis, or if the region decided uh, it could be prolonged, it, it could be extended for the for next triennium, but the rules are two, uh, two terms of reference, it means two triennium. So you have 
two seats for Europe and Central Asia. You have one seat for Middle East and Northern Africa, one seat for Western and Central Africa, and you have one seat to, for Eastern and South, Southern Africa. So please, for each region during your coordination or, or at any moment during the working group, I will ask you to provide us with name here. So for representative and for alternate. If a representative leaves the, the, um, the standing committee as its name of country, uh, another, uh, another um, person could be the representative or the alternate will, will take over. Next proposed decision. The, the resolution will reconfirm that the standing committee should also include a representative of the host country for the next session of the MOP. So on Saturday we will know which country will host the MOP. Have we got an invitation? So you have to confirm this uh, and to approve this invitation. So one representative of the host country and a representative of the depository, and that is the Kingdom of uh, Netherlands, the Netherlands. Then, in operative paragraph four, you will agree that the standing committee will meet at least once between this mob and the next one. We'll try to have two meetings, but at least in the resolution, the standing committee has to meet at least once. We do also electronic consultation. On paragraph five, uh, you can decide to make a provision into the budget for payment of uh, uh, travel of, uh, of expenses of appointed standing uh, committee member from developing country and country with economies in transition. And in the last operative paragraph, uh, you, you could request parties to provide financial assistance for other developing countries or economy in transition to be part of the standing committee as, observe, as an observer. So the action request by, from the MOP is first to provide nomination for the five regional representatives and alternates, and then to adopt the draft resolution 10 once it will be completed by name. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacques. Um, are there any requests uh, for the floor on this particular item? Okay. Thank you very much, doing well. We move on to agenda item 24B. Um, that's going to be on the institutional arrangement for the technical committee. It's a draft resolution number 11. Uh, CJ will take us through that one. Thank you, Chair. This is the other committee that uh, serves as a subsidiary body in the intersessional period. So I would quickly run you through the text of the proposed resolution. In the preamble, uh, first uh, paragraph notes the expiration of the term of office of six technical committee members and that one vacant post has been in place since the last triennium takes note of the technical committee report to MOP7, which was yesterday presented by Salius, and recognizes the need for prior review by the meeting of the parties of the technical committee tasks to allow prioritization, resource allocation, hopefully, and mobilization. It also recognizes that there are factors impacting the secretariat's facilitative role to the technical committee, which are related to capacity in the secretariat, and it refers to resolution 7.10, still draft resolution 7.10, concerning the new standing committee regionalization uh, and takes into account the, technical, the current technical committee recommendation regarding the affiliation of three countries, Burundi, Chad, and Rwanda, and the request of those three countries on this matter. The proposed decision in the operative paragraph one is to appoint the technical committee members and alternates as per Appendix 1 in the resolution following the recommendation of the advisory group. Currently, uh, the Appendix 1 is, uh, is blank. Uh, I will show you the recommended 
technical committee member candidates. Operative paragraph two suggests adoption of the technical committee work plan for the period 2019-2021 as appended uh, to uh, the resolution in appendix two. Operative paragraph three instructs the secretary to provide the necessary support to the technical committee. And next one urges the parties to provide a junior professional officer to the Secretariat for Technical Committee support. This was already discussed at several occasions during this meeting. The next paragraph encourages the parties to include the Technical Committee members into their MOP delegations. And the final two, adopt the change in the regional uh, affiliation of the three countries and instructs the Secretariat to update accordingly Annex 1 to the TC modus operandi, which contains the full regionalization. Uh, so for Burundi and Rwanda, they will move from the Central African region to Eastern African region, while Chad will move from Western Africa to Central Africa. So regarding the proposals of the advisory group, uh, the advisory group which uh, reviews the nominations submitted for vacant technical committee positions consists of the chairs and vice chairs of the two subsidiary committees, the STC and the TC, as well as the executive secretary uh, and myself. We had several vacancies uh, following the expiration of the terms of office of six of uh, the members. Uh, therefore, the recommendations are indicated here in red color. For Central Europe, uh, Salius, uh, the chair of the technical committee, is retiring. Uh, the recommendation of the advisory group is to appoint Mr. Tauland Bino from Albania. For the Southwestern Asia, uh, the new candidate that is recommended for election is Mr. Late El Mugrabi from Jordan. For Western Africa, the recommended candidate is Ms. Kadi Gueye-Fo from Senegal. And for Eastern Africa, the recommended candidate is Mr. Peter Njoroge from Kenya. For the Northeast, uh, for North and Southwestern Europe, uh, the, the current incumbent remains. This is uh, Ruth Cromie from the United Kingdom, who is also currently a vice chair of the committee. For the Northern African region, uh, the remaining uh, member is uh, Mr. Sidi Matjerkoui from Morocco. And for Southern Africa, the remaining uh, and serving uh, a member is Ms. Lizanne Roxburgh from South Africa. We have two regions for which we did not receive nominations. One of those is Central Africa, for which we had a vacancy also in the past period. And for Eastern Europe, we also uh, didn't have uh, a vacancy. Uh, my apologies, actually, the Central European region is Lorenzo Serra, who is uh, retiring from the committee. Salio Svazas is representing Eastern Europe. So unfortunately, the region he has been representing in the last six years did not nominate a candidate. Also, the advisory group uh, did not recommend any alternates for those four regions for which it uh, actually recommended nominate representatives. So the recommendation is to adopt this constitution of the technical committee as you see it on the screen. Continu this is for the regional representatives. The other electable positions are thematic experts. We have two serving members uh, which are continuing. One is uh, Mr. Pierre de Fordiro from France, uh, who is the expert on game management, and Mr. Philippe Carp also from France, uh, who is expert on rural development. Uh, Melissa Lewis, who presented uh, two of uh, the products of the Technical Committee earlier today. She has been with the Technical Committee for 10 years as environmental law expert. Uh, that was a long time ago that she, she joined the committee and she, she has provided excellent service. 
Um, so her replacement, uh, the recommendation for her replacement is Mr. Emmanuel uh, Kisembazi from Uganda. With respect to the technical committee work plan for the next triennium, uh, it contains two parts. Part one is the top priority tasks, and there have been a, a preliminary costing made for the tasks. It amounts to nearly 800,000 euros to be able to deliver on those tasks. And part two is the full list of tasks, current full list, which is just above a million euros. However, this draft of the technical committee work plan does not include all the mandates that you are going to give to the technical committee with the decisions you are going to take at this meeting. Uh, therefore, um, in the course of, of the meeting, we are going to complete the draft technical committee work plan based on the revised resolutions tomorrow evening. So on, Thursday, on Friday, the, the Secretariat is going to revise the, the committee uh, draft work plan and will present it to you uh, on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergei. Um, we are not going to open the floor on this particular item. Um, taking it that you have had uh, some of the expectations, especially also regional groups, on what needs to be done. Um, I hope it's acceptable. Thank you. Let's move on to um, financial and administrative matters. We, we are going to take a report on finance and administrative issues. That is agenda item 25A. Uh, delegates are referred to document number 7.36, Rev 1, on this particular item um, on finance and administrative issues. Uh, the Executive Secretary will take us through that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will deliver this uh, presentation in French, and you have the slide in, in English. Le secrétariat comprend membres. We have in the Secretariat 12 members, and the 12 members are as follows. We have 7.25 full-time positions funded from the core budget, and we have 4.15 full-time equivalents funded through the so-called voluntary contributions. Talking about the 4.15 full-time equivalents, they are relevant to the African Initiative Unit for 50%. Emile Boloko is working there, and we have uh, Birgit Dreru also working in the African Initiative uh, Unit. Uh, then we have uh, the uh, position of the person dealing with the Single Species Action Plan, uh, supported and funded 100% through the Norwegian uh, Party, that I would like to extend my thanks to. And we have uh, two uh, people working in the European Goose Management Platform. And this is funded uh, by all of the uh, parties, all the states that participate in this platform. The staff is distributed in four different entities, so I won't insist on that. I've already covered that yesterday during my presentation. And uh, following your decision, the decision that you made uh, during uh, MOP6 in Bonn in 2015, the three uh, positions of uh, administrative officers, G4, uh, positions, G4 uh, positions, have been promoted, upgraded to G5. And that was back in 2017. And that was following the decision that you made in November 2015. I mean, this shows, by the way, how long these administrative process, uh, processes take. And unfortunately, we can't do it any faster. Now, in addition to some work that was done by the uh, Secretariat of uh, CMS, AIBA also funded and financed uh, some work uh, towards the evaluation, the assessment of the positions of all of the so-called P staff, and that was back in 2016. 
What is the outcome of uh, the assessment carried out by a, an independent expert? The conclusions, by the way, were submitted uh, in Nairobi. Uh, the purpose of this assessment was uh, to look at uh, the positioning of in the uh, UN uh, grid uh, compared uh, to the tasks and responsibilities given to our staff. And the expert said that all of the uh, posts were not at the required level because, uh, because he compared the responsibilities uh, and the tasks tasks of uh, what is done here at AIVA compared to the uh, grid adopted by the United Nations. And he suggested, it's just, just a proposal, of course, that all of the uh, P uh, posts or P positions be uh, upgraded one notch above, exactly one notch above. In other words, P4 would become P5, uh, P3 would be upgraded uh, to P4, and the uh, three uh, positions funded uh, from the core budget uh, that are uh, the P2 positions should be upgraded to P3. That's the suggestion made by the independent expert. Let's now talk about the budget-related uh, aspect. And I would like to remind you very quickly of something, because you will see, of course, the detail of all these figures uh, in the uh, report that has been uh, submitted, and especially in Annexes 1 and 2 of uh, Report uh, 736, Revision 2. You will have all of that, of course, in this report. But just uh, the highlights here. First of all, uh, the assess the contributions of the parties for the triennium, two million seven hundred sixty-eight thousand seven hundred seventy-eight euros for a total budget of uh, uh, three. You see the figures here of over uh, three million. We had decided uh, to take out 170,000 million euros from the uh, reserve fund to ensure a constant budget. Talking about uh, unpaid uh, pledges as of the 30th of September 2018, 411,310 euros. But we have to note that, first of all, for three quarters of this amount, this is due to past arrears. arrears prior to 2018, uh, prior uh, to the accession, uh, you know, from the accession of some countries up until 2017. So these are uh, past arrears. It's a significant amount, 75% of that. And the Secretary for the last three years have been, has been expanding considerable, I would like to say considerable efforts in order to clear up these arrears. And in uh, compliance with uh, uh, the resolution on budget adopted at the MOP6 for the first time this year, uh, the countries that have more than three years in arrears have not been getting uh, financial support in order to take part, uh, to participate in MOP7. It was very important, we felt, and the donors that have uh, uh, funded, uh, you know, regularly the subsidized uh, participants uh, wanted this uh, kind of principle to be enforced. We have uh, taken out of the reserve funds 124,000 uh, euros to be added to the 310,000 euros already granted uh, during MOP6. What about expenditures? The expenditures have shown a positive year of end balance in 2016. The positive balance was 73,720 euros. In 2017, uh, the balance is also positive, 14,423 euros. But we're expecting a deficit, not a significant one, but nevertheless a uh, deficit in 2018. Where we have uh, the administrative financial unit uh, made available to Iowa uh, by uh, Nairobi, we think that we will be uh, using up the budget uh, to the rate of 98 percent. The implementation rate will be extremely high, and this shows that all of the resources that you've been voting on, all of these resources are fully implemented and fully used. Talking about uh, the uh, trust fund balance, on the 30th of December 2017, the figure was 522,472 American dollars. But uh, this reserve fund also includes the advance payments of the different parties. So we have a fund of 522,472 American dollars. You may think that this is a lot, but in it, we already have advance payments for uh, 2019 to the tune of 140,179 euros. So it's not money that is in, in uh, that we have, um, you know, to spend. I mean, it's money that we will 
use and we will need in 2019 advanced payments. So you will see in your documents the different budget allocations uh, uh, separated in uh, staff, contractual services, uh, travel expenses, equipment, vehicles and furniture. We don't really have vehicles actually, but that's the nomenclature of a MOJA system and that's where we have vehicles here, even though we don't have vehicles ourselves. You have all of the budgets voted uh, as per resolution 6.18 and you will see indeed that most of the expenditures are linked to a salary wages, more than 70 percent of that, and the second largest expense has to do with the uh, money taken by UNON and uh, UNEP, 13 percent on all of the credits to fund uh, particularly the team supporting us in Bonn and also uh, uh, support services that are supplied by Nairobi. So it's a 13 percent charge that is levied. Voluntary contributions, I had already mentioned this uh, yesterday. Um, Sixty-four percent. Remember the budget of three billion voted by MUP6. So it fluctuates between 562,000 euros that was in 2016 and 714,000 euros in 2017. You will find, and I won't go in detail, all the, de the projects that are funded through the voluntary contributions and following the agreement of the Standing Committee, we now have on the website a specific tab that you can click that explains how EVA is financed. It will allow you to find for each party to EVA uh, the detail of assessed contributions. You will know whether uh, this or that party has the real or not. It is updated every week. And you also have a web page that uh, gives you information on all of the voluntary contributions. And every time uh, you will be referred to hyperlinks that will um, give you a description of the action that was funded by one or several uh, donating donors, donning, uh, donor countries. So what is expected now from the meeting of parties? What are expecting from you is that first of all, you should take note of this report. That's what we're expecting from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will open the floor for if there's any principal comment on the uh, report on finance and the uh, administrative issues as presented. Okay, in the absence of any party wanting to take the floor, we'll move on to the last part of the agenda before the working groups. Agenda item 25B and also agenda item 25C. We'll take them together. Um, they deal with two issues of importance on finance and administrative matters, focusing one on draft scale of contributions for the triennium 2019 to 2021, and also on the draft budget proposal for 2019 to 2021. The Executive Secretary will take us through those items. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Là aussi, je présenterai... Well, here again, I will present, uh, I will make my presentation in English. You have the English uh, slides to, to follow, and of course you can, and I recommend to put your, your headset as well. Donc, je vais tout d'abord exposer uh, l'échelle des contributions proposées. Pour... So, I'm going to talk about the scale of contributions suggested uh, for the period 2019-2021. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, the uh, distribution key of the uh, budget that you will be voting on. So, it's the budget scenario that you will have to examine and review during the uh, working group that will meet as of this afternoon and then again tomorrow. And the overall budget will be distributed uh, amongst the different parties of AEVA. Uh, and this would be done uh, based on uh, the uh, distribution key that you will have adopted. Now, uh, this distribution method, this distribution method was the outcome of significant work that we did over the last three years, because there was resolution 6.18 adopted at MOP6 uh, that was asking us to describe the differences uh, between uh, the scale of uh, contributions of the United Nations as voted regularly at the uh, uh, General Assembly and the scales that have been used since MOP4 in 2008 because, in fact, there had been an extremely important discussion during MOP6, as you remember. 
we tried to understand what was uh, the uh, distribution key at MUP4 that had been adopted since MUP4. And in fact, this uh, distribution was an ad hoc distribution method. There was no mathematical formula um, leading to this. The Standing Committee had decided in January 2017 on the basis of a report and an analysis supplied by the uh, Secretariat uh, to move towards the use of this uh, UN scale, the scale adopted by the United uh, Nations uh, General Assembly. And in July 2018, after a second report was presented with different scenarios, the IEFA Standing Committee decided to apply a number of criteria to, again, move forward, move closer to the uh, UN distribution scale, whilst at the same time trying to limit increases for contributions. Because since we hadn't changed scales for uh, 10 years, Uh, some economies, uh, some countries saw uh, a sharp improvement of their economies, and of course, uh, after the years, the difference between what should have been uh, paid uh, uh, 10 years ago and what has to be paid now, this gap is, of course, very, very significant. So we want to restrict that as much as possible. So let us say a few words about this UN scale of assessments. Let's go into the principle and uh, the principle that everybody should be on equal footing. And all of the countries that are members of the United Nations, your governments have adopted this principle. The principle is that the contributions should be apportioned according to the financial capacity of the member states. This is based on a, an extremely detailed and precise methodology. Well, mainly, of course, uh, this methodology is based on uh, the elements referring to each country's economic situation. Uh, this is a scale that is adopted, as I said, uh, by the uh, UN General Assembly. It's adopted on a three-year basis, and uh, the changes uh, will reflect the uh, economic and financial changes uh, uh, that emerge in the countries that are members of the United Nations. I'm sure that you won't be able to read from where you're sitting, but you have here the list of countries in alphabetical order, and every time you have a percentage that corresponds to the assessed contribution of that country. So uh, if you add up all of the percentage pages, there are three pages of that, you will get 100%. In other words, if you read closely, take an example, let me pick the first country here on the list, Afghanistan, they will pay six thousands of the total expenditures to be distributed between uh, the uh, member states of the United Nations. So this is a scale that is adopted uh, by all of your governments, has been uh, adopted by all of your governments, and uh, the Standing Committee of AIVA has decided to move towards this uh, UN scale. And of course, there will be a transitional period. It won't happen overnight. We decided that we should get back uh, to uh, this uh, scale for assess contributions. And by the way, this is the rule that uh, prevails uh, in the AIVA treaty uh, that stipulates that, of course, the member states can decide on adopting a different scale. And that's why uh, we had had another one since then. So what are the criteria adopted by the uh, Standing Committee? First of we want to keep a minimum contribution of 2,000 euros uh, when uh, the uh, application of the uh, scale uh, gives you lower amounts. It should be 2,000. We want to maintain the contribution of the EU at the original 2.5 percent, as foreseen initially in the text of the treaty. We want to also retain the maximum thresholds at 20 percent, which means that a, any party to AIVA cannot pay more than 20 percent of the budget. We also want uh, to get to have a sort of transitional period to move towards the UN scale, and this would expand over six years, in other words, two uh, mob cycles, so that's a transitional period, but uh, uh, UNEP and uh, the Financial and Administrative uh, a unit, management unit, asked us to present a scenario for the upcoming three years, because of course the new scale uh, is not yet known. Now, in order to limit the very sharp increases, because you will see the outcomes, and for some of you, um, you've already, I'm sure, looked into the potential impact uh, that uh, the adoption of such, such a scale will have for your contributions, it was decided for the initial three-year period to freeze the contributions, which uh, following uh, the application of uh, the next scale would have uh, decreased. So this means that uh, we need some effort on the part of the countries that could have had reduced contributions. We are asking them to maintain the same amount. Generally speaking, the ministries of the ministers of finance do not like increases. Most of the time, 
uh, they do not want to see their contributions increase, but they agree to maintain their contributions at the same level. And this will mitigate the very sharp increases for several countries if we do that, if we freeze the contributions. And one last point, which is also suggested in the resolution, something that was missing in the past, we would like to direct the contributions from the uh, new parties that will uh, have become members of Iowa uh, in the meantime into uh, the uh, fund. Uh, so we have applied the criteria for 2019 and 2021. MOP 8 will decide for the next uh, cycle. And the fact that we should freeze the contributions that were supposed to uh, decrease, uh, this uh, allowed us uh, to uh, uh, safeguard 121,428 euros that were saved and were uh, distributed uh, between the countries that actually supplied the highest contributions. So there's one lesson to take uh, to uh, learn from this uh, uh, scale for the same budget. And we've presented the calculations to the standing committee, but you also have in your documents this kind of calculation that we're presenting to you. So we took the same budget. We took the reference budget of MOP6, this budget that has to be shared between different parties. Well, the fact that we should move from our ad hoc scale uh, towards the UN scale of assessment, this will have, of course, an impact on the uh, countries uh, that are above uh, the minimum contribution. And also, it will have an impact for some countries which are below the minimum uh, contributions because there were some countries below that uh, contribution. If uh, their economy has improved, however, well, that will mean that at some point they will also have to pay contribution higher than 2,000 euros. And for the parties that have seen uh, uh, their contribution frozen, in other words, uh, it did not decrease where they could have expected it to decrease, well, 19 parties will be uh, impacted by this if we stick to uh, the budget scenario number one. You will see all of this in the document that will be presented to you. You will see that you will have here the list of the different parties uh, to Iowa. You have the budget and the scale that had been suggested at uh, MOP6. Uh, we had uh, already tried to move towards the UN scale. You you have the budget that has been adopted, had been adopted by MOP6, and then uh, you have uh, the budget as suggested to MOP7 if we are to apply at the UN scale and retain scenario number one. Uh, in other words, a, a scenario of the three million uh, um, that I mentioned earlier on in constant uh, terms. So all of these details, all of this uh, figure, uh, we will uh, look at more carefully, of course, within the working group sessions, and the secretary will be available to you uh, to uh, review uh, all of your individual situations, of course. Uh, my colleague, Maya Mansour, who's at the back of the room, will be with me because he's become an expert in the extremely intricate and complicated formula, and he's an expert at working with the Excel table system. So the transitional period. I said three years at first, because here we have assessed the contributions on a triennium. But in order to mitigate somewhat or to uh, restrict uh, the very uh, sharp increases of some contributions, we are suggesting to apply, first of all, an increase of 30 percent, then 33 percent, then 37 percent year on year to reach 100 percent at the end of uh, the, uh, this uh, period of time. And then MOP8, on the basis of the updated uh, uh, UN uh, scale, will have to decide the way forward. So resolution 7.12 now suggests that we adopt this new scale, if you so decide, and we would do this on Saturday. So, Mr. Chairman, this would be my first presentation. Thank you very much. That was a presentation on the draft scale of contributions for the triennium 2019 to 2021, the item that's going to be discussed in detail in Working Group 2 on Finance and Administration. We now move to item 25C, which is the last item before we go to the working groups, um, looking at the draft budget proposal for 2019 to 2021. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've just seen the scale, the distribution system or method. Now we have to see how much budget we will have available. And both are linked, of course. That's why we're introducing these two um, subjects together. And then you will see what is the annual um, assessed uh, contribution that you will have to 
uh, pay to UNEP that administers uh, the Secretariat of Iowa. Just a few words about the context. Since uh, MOP4, uh, it's been 10 years now, 10 full years since MOP4, there has been no budget increase. Uh, no more resources allocated to Iowa's uh, secretariat. There's even been a drop in um, actual growth terms because we've never taken into account and factored in the inflation that has occurred since then. The budget uh, is mainly uh, uh, you know, paying salaries and wages. Uh, we saw uh, the amounts allocated uh, by MOP6. There are two uh, basic operations that do not uh, take into uh, account the different projects. The projects are not covered uh, by this. Uh, for these projects, uh, for uh, the funding the reports, we have to look for uh, voluntary contributions on top of the core budget. Let me also remind you that over the last uh, 10 years, uh, the successive uh, MOPs have voted a on a withdrawal from the uh, trust fund of of uh, 820,000 euros, which is sizable. It's almost uh, uh, an operating budget, uh, uh, the equivalent of a, a full year of operating budget. Now, if we are to continue uh, with the, uh, this, we will lose skills. Uh, uh, we will not be as good when it comes to implementing the agreement, or uh, we will lose out on the communication side of uh, our activities. I really have to say this very bluntly and very frankly. This is definitely a risk. So. A few words about uh, the uh, drafting of the budget. Uh, first of all, we looked at the budget lines that were uh, to fund the seven uh, P uh, level uh, professionals and the five administrative officers, and we've merged this into one budget line to allow for uh, easier management. If we have a, a budget line for one person that showed a deficit of 10 uh, euros, it would be complicated. So it was much easier to, in fact, merge all of these budget lines into one. We also merged the uh, budget lines concerning the translation costs, because in the previous uh, budgets that you would vote on, we would have one budget line for the standing committee, one budget line for the technical committee, one budget line for the MOP. So three different ones. So if the secretary did not spend all of the uh, credit on uh, the uh, translation um, budget line of the technical committee, for example, it would be very difficult to use the remainder for the next meeting. So in order to avoid uh, these difficult management issues, all of the uh, translation costs have been merged into one single budget line. Another thing that we chose, and this was decided already at MOP6, was to factor in the uh, standard um, wage-related and salary-related costs and other standard costs for the entire CMS family. This was a, a request uh, that was also presented to us by UNEP, by the way. And one last point, which is of minor impact in the budget, but this is something that we're having to factor in uh, following uh, the adoption of the Omoja system. The part-time um, Part time for uh, uh, UN staff can only be either on a 50% basis or 80% basis. We used to have, uh, um, you know, um, officers working 75% of the time. It is no longer possible. Part time needs to be increased by 5% to reach 80%, and this represents an overall cost of 3,500 euros per year that we've already factored in and included in the four scenarios that we'll be presenting to you. From the first scenario, uh, zero. Uh, um, growth uh, to the fourth one. So we have resolution uh, 618. As per resolution 618, uh, we had uh, to develop some scenarios. We decided to develop four of them. This is something that was decided by the standing committee. But the resolution said we had to develop a number of scenarios. So the first one, as I said, is what we call the zero nominal growth scenario. Uh, so no re no zero nominal growth, as it says here. The second one, zero real growth. This, of course, factored in, factors in the uh, inflation rate. Quite simply, it's mechanical. Uh, we have year one, and on year two, we add 2% of the budget to take into account the inflation rate. Then we have a scenario three that allows us to actually uh, secure uh, the uh, positions of uh, part-time staff. Uh, people who, in fact, uh, work 80% uh, of the time or full-time, and then scenario four, that will allow AEVA, the Secretariat, and yourselves uh, to fulfill the obligations of the, uh, cre uh, the treaty, and that's a minimum, and we'll see how later. So we have all these four scenarios that go from uh, uh, 3,078,778 euros, which is exactly 
to the point the budget that was allocated in 2004 all the way to 4 million 143,811 euros for uh, scenario number four so let me now go in detail but very quickly about each and one of them we have a scenario one zero nominal growth so no change at all when it comes to staffing costs as indicated uh, the uh, we have upgrade we have upgraded uh, some staff and we take into account the inflation rate year after year, but not here. And uh, uh, this uh, scenario will not be viable for maintaining the current uh, staff in the Secretariat. Uh, and this scenario will not be viable. Number one, we won't be able to maintain uh, the uh, staff cost, but it would need to be complemented by higher voluntary contributions than is the case so far for the last three years, despite the fact uh, that this is possible as per the uh, rules of the United Nations. We're all uh, traveling in economy class, uh, no matter how long it takes, even to come here to Johannesburg, we've had to travel in economy class. So we really want uh, to conserve birds. That's our prime most uh, objective. So. Uh, scenario one, called in English zero uh, nominal growth. Now we have scenario number two, zero real growth. Here uh, we simply factor in the um, inflation rate. Uh, um, and this is an increase compared to the first scenario of 4%, which is not peanuts. It doesn't allow you to do much more. It just uh, limits and mitigates uh, the, the damage, if I may say, um, um, you know, preventing further erosion of our resources. And of course, uh, we will also need uh, extensive uh, voluntary contributions. Scenario number three, it is pretty much identical to uh, scenario number two with an increase of 5% of operational costs because unfortunately, uh, some uh, costs uh, increase faster than the inflation rate. And we would uh, suggest uh, to increase uh, the uh, part time of uh, uh, the uh, two um, administrative um, assistance, one working within the communication unit and the other working for the African initiative to move them from 50 to 80 percent. Another option that could also be qualified as scenario 3B would be to move the post of a coordinator of the African initiative from 50 percent to 100 percent full time. But the increase would be sharper. Rather than having a 4.8 percent increase, it would be 8.4 percent, not 4.8, but 8.4. The de ce scenario. The great advantage of uh, Scenario 3 is that it would allow to use voluntary contributions for projects instead of uh, trying to find uh, funding so that uh, Are we getting there? Okay, I'm getting a sign that uh, it's coming. Uh, we, 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 we can't see the the main one? Is it there? Okay. All right. Thank you. Apologize. So I was explaining that scenario four would uh, amount to over four million, four million one hundred and forty-three thousand. For those of you who attend a mop for the first time, these scenarios are. Uh, proposals and in the working group you will be discussing on the basis of those four scenarios to a, uh, adopt a consensus um, proposal that will be adopted on Saturday. Let me again repeat that as for your individual contributions, you need to take into account both the budget scenarios, number one, till four, as well as the new scale of uh, contributions scale of assessment. For most countries, most parties who had a minimum uh, contribution of 2,000 euros, the uh, new scale of contribution does not um, change anything except for those who have um, enjoyed uh, economic uh, development. And uh, we have noted that five of those countries are um, recently acceded to the European Union. And uh, the scale, the UN scale of assessment shows actually that there was an impact, a positive impact on their economic development. Now, for the 19 parties who 
will see an increase under scenario one. Of course, should scenario two, three, or four be adopted, there would be a further increase. And for those parties with frozen contributions in scenario, under scenario one, depending on the UN scale of assessments, those countries might see an increase of their contributions should uh, scenario two be adopted, or maybe there would be an increase only if scenario four is adopted. That depends on uh, the scenario adopted. So you should keep that in uh, mind, although I understand it's quite difficult and complicated. What action is required from the MOP? Of course, in the working group today and tomorrow, we will go over uh, the different budget scenarios and you will have to propose a budget for adoption during the plenary on Saturday. Of course, uh, draft resolution number 12 will summarize uh, the decisions that you will be taking with annexes showing the new scale of contributions uh, for everyone. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, the Executive Secretary, Jack, for, for this. As he has indicated, these are uh, agenda items that are uh, going to be discussed thoroughly uh, with the support that's required for clarification in the working group, uh, working group two on finance and administration. We have exhausted all the agenda items that were prioritized for plenary uh, from yesterday and also up to today. We seem to have regained the time that we had lost and uh, I would like to thank all of you for your cooperation. Um, we need to appreciate ourselves for the fact that we could cover all of them before half past four, if we can do that appreciation. Um, we will take uh, the few announcements that we have before you break for tea and also uh, be informed of as to where the working groups are going to be. Um, Secretariat will take us through those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. So there will be a coffee break until half past four. So please be sharp at half past four in the respective rooms, uh, depending on which working group you'll be joining. Working group one on technical and scientific issues will be meeting in the plenary hall here. Working group two on finance and administration will be meeting in room Flamingo, where side events have been taking place yesterday and today. This is the meeting room close to the lunch area. Also at half past four, please be sharp so that the next two hours until half past six could be fully utilized. Those countries that have made statements in the plenary, please do submit them to the Secretariat so that we can actually reflect them where necessary. If you cannot submit them by email because of uh, interruptions in the email service, internet service, please do approach the front table and deliver them on a memory stick to Nina. She will collect those statements. It's essential that we receive them sooner than later. So please do that now after the closure of this session. And the last announcement is that tonight there will be two parallel side events, and you could see them on the screen uh, on the alternating slides. The first one is in the room Flamingo. It's uh, convened by the Indian government and the Bombay Natural History Society, who are represented uh, here at this meeting today. Uh, this is on the Central Asian Flyway. They will be presenting the initiative of the Indian government to fulfill the decision of the CAF range states from 2012 to bring a proposal to 
the AO meeting of the parties for extension of the region so that the Central Asian Flyway Action Plan is incorporated into this treaty. So this is an important side event and an interesting as well. I would particularly urge the countries which are already in the CAF region, such as uh, Uzbekistan, Georgia, and the United Kingdom, the three parties that are here, and some of the range states like uh, Saudi Arabia, which is also a CAF range state, and they're also represented in the room, to, to join this side event. But it's also, of course, an important uh, event for other parties uh, to uh, understand what is the um, intention of the Indian government and how they're going to proceed with that. The second side event, which is a parallel one, unfortunately, so that it's a competing side event, will be taking place in the other uh, side event room, the Pelican Room, uh, and it's convened by the University of Cambridge. They'll be presenting the Conservation Evidence Initiative with which the, the AWA Secretary has established a formal partnership and this is, uh, uh, there is also a booth in the exhibition area, uh, so uh, you could also approach there to learn a little bit more. But please do join, uh, please do, uh, join this side event for those who are more interested uh, uh, in the, on, the, on the implementation, on, uh, who are practitioners. They will actually learn very interesting uh, way of acquiring information on um, which methods in conservation work, which do not work. It's a very useful tool, so I could only recommend that you also join these two side events. Um, so please do make your choice. The side events will be taking place between six, uh, 18.45 hours to, uh, to 19.30, so 45 minutes in the evening. The important and interesting side events. So thank you, Chair. And uh, I guess you could close the session for today. Yes, uh, the session is uh, suspended, the plenary, up until Saturday morning. Wish you well in the working groups. Uh, it's tea break now, up until that time, half past four. Thank you very much.